right, well, I had them do two chapters, as you can see. Uh, that's kind of a, sounds like a lofty, lofty goal to accomplish this, but I really felt like we needed to just uh, bring these two together and what we're doing, wrapping up the book of Revelation. And really, this is the last chapter of the last book of the entire Bible, and what a great way to end, right? Uh, we don't know. We're getting into this point now. The end of this earth, he had a millennial reign, the a millennial reign of Christ, and then now we're going into eternity. And this is where there's a lot of puzzle in my mind. I mean, even in the millennial kingdom, there's a lot of, of mysteries that I'm not completely sure what goes on. But then you get into eternity, we have no idea, no idea. This is what we fantasize about. This is what I remember growing up, different movies would try to, uh, you know, uh, give some kind of idea what heaven might be like. Sometimes it would be like somebody would be living in the dream and all the best things on earth, you know, they could uh, think about or the things that they would do, uh, they, they would have access to in heaven. And and uh, it's pretty, in, in some ways, comical to see what the world views as heaven because they don't know Christ. They don't have the love of the Lord. And so, like, the thought of, like, serving Him for all eternity is foreign to their mind. And all they're thinking about is, man, I'm going to have a mansion in heaven and a you know, big fishing pond, you know, where I can just fish all day, every day. I mean, that sounds like fun to some degree. <laughs> but, but if you don't understand the joy that comes from serving the Lord, uh, you won't understand. That, uh, and that doesn't mean you're not going to heaven, but you won't understand how wonderful it is until you're actually there in glorified body. Uh, so anyway, you know, we, we, I remember talking to the kids growing up and we'd fantasize and kind of joke around about like houses being made out of out of cookies and candy and, and you know, uh, seas made out of chocolate milk or whatever, just silly things, you know, we would talk about. And, of course, we know at the end of the day none of those are going to compare to uh, to how wonderful heaven's going to be. And so the title of the message this afternoon is How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. And maybe this would be like one of the most positive messages that could ever be, <laughs> ever be preached, okay? Don't worry, Thursdays, the title of Thursday's message is Homophobia. And so it'll get a little more intense, okay? But this is a simple, uh, super positive uh, message. Why? Because that's really how we're left. If you're saved, if you're saved, this is positive. As positive as it gets. This is etern eternal life. This is what it's all about. Uh, everything else that happened in the scope of eternity is just like a speck. It's nothing, you know? And, uh, and so here we are. How beautiful heaven must be. <clears throat> and so uh, I'll tell you what the title of the message was going to be. Um, the last few chapters, Iola and Kansas City, we've been on the same page, on the same chapter, and it's been really hard for me to preach other messages, so they kind of end up being mixed together. And so I've taken two messages and mixed them together, uh, but uh, the, 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 mess, the overall title is just How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. I'll tell you what the title is going to be here in a minute. But let's look at this chapter 21. And uh, let's see a few things that we see in this chapter. Look at verse 1. We see a f the first heaven. I'm sorry. We see that the first heaven and, uh, and the earth has passed away, and now we see a uh, new heaven. Okay? I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now, this is interesting. Uh, we know that the Bible says heaven and earth is going to pass away, right? Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So he was saying, hey, it, we all understand, one of these days the world's going to pass away. I mean, even uh, today's scientists uh, foreshadow someday, however many millions of years they might say it, it, it could happen, uh, that the earth is going to, you know, be destroyed or the sun's going to stop burning or a uh, meteor's going to hit us or something like that because it's inevitable that the wor everything's going to come to an end. And uh, the Bible des describes how it comes to an end. We've been reading about it in the book of Revelation, but let's look at a, a just Second Peter and see it kind of uh, put into just a few verses here what happens. Second Peter chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 10, the, the, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away, with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. 
global warming, right? I mean, this is, that's, that's the real global warming that's going to be caused by the hand of, of Jesus. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. So if you live on this earth thinking, you know what, this isn't going to be here forever. This isn't going to last forever. It's all going to just vanish away. It's all going to be melted and, and burn up with fire. Well, that really puts things in a perspective about how you live your life. Well, it's not about the here and now. It's about eternity. And so it really affects the way that you would live your life because heaven and earth are going to pass away. And so what we see here, <coughs> a reminder that the heaven and earth has passed away. Now, you know, I was thinking like in chapter 20, we talked about the resurrection and then, in the res and then there's the millennial kingdom. Satan's bound up for a thousand years and then he's released again after the thousand years. And so you would look at this and maybe say like, wow, why have, all of a sudden are we seeing the old earth and uh, the old earth and heaven passed away and, and all that? What about the millennial kingdom? Well, it's kind of hard to tell exactly uh, what's going on here, but I assume that what he's seeing here is that after the wrath of God's poured out in the final days, uh, you know, the day of the Lord, and on those final days, he's, he's poured out his judgment and uh, he's now taken over the kingdom. I assume that for a thousand years, we're all, that's kind of what we're doing. We're ruling and reigning. Uh, I, I don't know to what degree we're, we're judging angels. People are, are working. There are people that are, there are like mortal men that are still living. And the conditions go back to it. It appears, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit here in a minute, it appears like the conditions kind of go back to like the Garden of Eden type times in the millennium. And, 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 and all. what could we do, be doing for a thousand years? But it seems to me like we're rebuilding the earth, right? So perhaps what we're seeing here in 21 is saying he's, he's seeing this new heaven and new earth, you know, in its current state, probably, uh, you know, after the thousand years that's been, uh, that's been seen. But then on this new earth, we see uh, in verse 2, he's going to see a new city, holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And, of course, we read about all the jewels and, uh, and just how precious it is. And so you can see kind of this idea about being a de uh, decorated and being adorned for, uh, as like a bride. But I, I can't help but see this literally. And he gives us the dimensions here in, uh, uh, let me see here, in verse 17, or verse 16. He says, The city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he met, measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length, length and the breadth and the, width, and the height sorry, of it are equal. Okay, so you've got... Uh, uh, 12,000 furlongs. You say, well, how much is that exactly? Well, I don't know. I've heard, I've heard people guess, all right? But and you see that the width and the length and the height are equal. What's that called? It's a cube, right? It seems weird, but it's not like the whole earth. We're not looking at the earth. We've already seen a new heaven and a new earth. The entire earth is, is in existence, okay? I believe the idea is that the old one was destroyed, and, and you say, well, it's, so did it completely cease to exist? Well, not necessarily. You think about like in the flood, you got the old world and the new world. That's the terminology that the Bible uses. So maybe it's just completely destroyed and then it's rebuilt. I don't know. But now you've got this thing that I take literally. I think that the city, this holy city comes down from heaven, uh, you know, where God dwells. And at this point in time, we can actually see what's going on. There's, we're in the spiritual realm ourselves. Okay, and then there's this big city that's like a cube right there coming down to New Jerusalem. So what's going on with the rest of the earth? This is just my speculation, okay? But look at verse 1 again. I noticed this as I was reading, and, uh, and I saw where it says, and there was no more sea. If anybody has another idea after the sermon, you can tell me. But uh, what, what did he mean? Like there's no more sea after the first heaven and first earth were destroyed, or... There's no sea even whenever he sees the first uh, uh, the, the new heaven and the new earth. And so here's my thought, okay? Uh, this, is just, this is just me throwing something out here. I've often tried to speculate in my mind, and I know there's a lot of things that our brains can't ever understand about, about these things, 
But I've tried to speculate, like, how can so many people inhabit the earth? I mean, what are there right now inhabiting the earth, like uh, 7 billion people, or maybe it's more than that now, I'm not sure. But I'm like, think about all throughout all generations, everybody who's ever been saved, right, from Adam all the way up until whenever, uh, you know, we enter <laughs> into that city. Uh, how many people have been saved? And then I've always thought, like, that if you add to that, I don't know how this all works, but the way I understand it, you know, a, a baby is innocent without sin. If the baby dies, it's a, it, it goes to heaven, okay? Uh, he or she goes to heaven. This is the way I understand it. This I think there's biblical grounds to back that up. And so if that's true, I've thought about what about all the abortions and all the babies that have died and all that. And I'm thinking all the people, you know, that have died, uh, uh, you know, before they were able to understand right and wrong. And I'm just thinking, how could so many people inhabit the earth? And again, my pea brain, I realize, can't contain, <laughs> can't understand all the information. But then I got to thinking about this and I'm saying, if you've got this new city that comes down, this new Jerusalem that comes down and it's cube, and it's however many, 12,000 furlongs. Some people have measured, again, I don't know exactly what a furlong is, uh, but I've heard people that say if you measure that out, it would basically cover North America, okay? This big cube covered North, Amer uh, North America, I think from, Canada, from the edge of Canada to the edge of uh, uh, the tip of uh, Mexico, and this whole city cubed, right? So we're, we're not obviously talking about not like everybody's not spread out with a whole bunch of acres of land, right? But in this city, it, it appears like maybe they're stacked on top of levels. I don't know. I don't know. And if the whole rest of the earth is inhabited as well with uh, people, you know, who were, who were born again, uh, you know, they're spread all out over the whole earth. Not, er not everybody's necessarily in the New Jerusalem, right? I don't know. If you got different ideas afterwards, you can let me know. But here's what my mind was thinking. There's no more sea, right? If, if, we're, if we're talking about the oceans, there's no more ocean. Think about how much of the earth is water. It's like 75%, they say, of the earth is water. Well, I know that there's water because there's a river of life flowing there and all that, and I take that to be literal. Uh, and so I, I believe that there's water, but perhaps the earth is distributed completely different. And now that 75% of uninhabited earth right, right now Maybe in that day, you know, won't, won't, be, uh, won't be a problem. Anyway, these are just things that my, uh, my uh, corruptible mind <laughs> thinks about. But we got the first heaven, first earth, the old, uh, I, mean, I mean, the new heaven and new earth, the old ones passed away, no sea, we see new Jerusalem coming down. But we just got done reading about uh, the millennial reign of Christ. And I didn't get into some of the details last week whenever I was talking, talking about the millennial kingdom. But I want you to consider this, that it appears to me what the Bible does show us about the millennial kingdom is that we're living in a near perfect world during that thousand years. Uh, 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 okay, Christ is ruling and reigning. All right, So you've got the majority of people are apparently... Uh, immortal. I'm talking about those who uh, are in the second. I mean, those who are in the resurrection. You know, we uh, we rule and reign with Christ, and so we're not going to die. We're immortal, and uh, we're in in uh, glorified bodies and all that. Well, look at uh, Isaiah chapter two. Most of the most of the pictures that we have about the millennial kingdom in the Bible from the Bible we take from Isaiah. I realize some of it could be uh, metaphoric. Some of it could be some stuff we don't understand because he was talking to uh, specific people in that day. And even though it's, it's inspired by God and it's preserved for us to read it now and apply it to ourselves, there's some things about the wording in, in, in the literature here that we might not completely understand. But listen to some of the things that the Bible says about this uh, millennial kingdom. Isaiah 2, look at verse 1 here. And the word of Isaiah, I'm sorry, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos uh, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow in, unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, 
and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. And we will uh, walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Could you imagine? Uh, all these many years, you know, Jerusalem has been considered the uh, holy land. And people will kind of make pilgrimages out there to, uh, to visit the holy land or whatever. But can you imagine if Jesus is actually there and he's sitting in the temple ruling and reigning and, and, and over all of the earth? Uh, it belongs to him, and we have opportunity to go there and to learn and sit at Jesus' feet. Uh, what a wonderful time. And can you imagine, I mean, there would have to be some kind of rotation, you know, <laughs> about who can, uh, who, who has this, uh, this time allotment, you know, to sit at Jesus' feet and learn uh, from him and talk to him. And, and uh, Jesus is going to be there. And then look at uh, uh, Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65, verse 20. <clears throat> Let's start with 19, actually. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. Now, yeah, there will be sin, unfortunately, still in the millennial kingdom, because there will be uh, corruptible man still that uh, exists in there. That's why we're ruling and reigning, and uh, God's enforcing laws over them. But, uh, but we'll see here, uh, this is some, some mortal man living there, but he says that a child shall die a hundred years old. I, I can't say this 100%, but the way I read that and understand it, it seems to me like what he's saying is if somebody's 100 years old and he dies, people will be like, hey, that was but a child who died. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so uh, it's quite possible. And, uh, and, and so you see this idea of long life. It kind of makes sense. You got a thousand year uh, span where we're ruling and reigning with Christ. And if the conditions of the earth go back to Garden of Eden-like conditions... And who knows what God just kind of does genetically to people. I don't know or how that all works out. But if you, see, if you go back to those kind of conditions and you've got, you know, everybody is, is working the land and, 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 and probably the knowledge. I mean, think about we're all in our glorified bodies and we're, and we're uh, giving out instructions and all that kind of stuff. Turning our uh, uh, weapons into plowshares. I'll read that verse here in a minute. And if, if, if everything is going right and the conditions are so great and longevity exists, I mean, think about how they were living shortly after, uh, you know, in the book of Genesis, like after the fall, we saw men living to be 969 years, you know, nine, uh, some, not between 900 and 1,000 years old they were living to be. And so you can see where it kind of goes back to that condition for 1,000 years. We're talking about near perfect conditions like God made it and intended for it to be. Okay, look at Isaiah, uh, what did I just read? Verse 25? Uh, no, let's see, 20, okay, keep reading. Verse 21, and they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat. For all the days of a tree are the days, I'm sorry, as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Uh, I mean, you know, we've been living under the curse for all these years, and now there's like a thousand years where we just get to just enjoy it <laughs> the way that it was meant to be. And, and we've got people uh, uh, working the land and, and doing what we tell them to do and all. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth uh, for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessing of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass uh, that before they call, I will answer. And, will, and, and while they were yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, saith the Lord. So you get this idea that the animals are gentle 
they're not fighting and devouring one another, and there's not a, a you know a whole bunch of a, 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 a violence and stuff going on. But the conditions are just so uh, near perfect. Look at chapter. Uh, uh, let me see here, chapter eleven. I already mentioned uh, the wolf and the lamb right there. Well, chapter 11 says the same thing. Isaiah chapter 11. Start in verse 6. Isaiah 11 verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. How would you like to give your child a pet tiger or a pet lion? Well, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> you got your own little uh, wildlife uh, reservation out there in your backyard or something. And the, cat, uh, and the wolf also, let's see, uh, verse 7, And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, which is a type of snake. And the wean child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Uh, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Uh, and, in the day, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and uh, his rest shall be glorious. How far was I going to read here? I already read past what I was going to. Okay, so you see this type of world would be living in the millennial kingdom, 1,000 years, near perfect conditions like Garden of Eden, like God intended it to be. Uh, with the one exception, there is still sin al alive and well. And we know that partly because after the 1,000 years, we read already in chapter 20 that, uh, that Satan will be released and he'll go back and he'll still deceive nations and he'll still try to rise up a, a following of people who go against God. I don't understand that. I don't understand how that's even possible. I don't understand who's going to be inhabiting uh, the earth outside of the, uh, you know, the immortals who've been resurrected and, and why in the world they would still fall back into sin. Don't completely understand it. Okay, but here's what I know is that when we get to chapter 21, it gets better. Okay, it gets even better. That was going to be the title of the message. It gets even better. But what I'm doing is combining two messages together. Uh, so how beautiful heaven must be. I want to share, share with you uh, five things, but I'll be really quick about it, uh, about why heaven is so wonderful. Some things about heaven, according to this text, that are going to be so wonderful. Back in Revelation 21. Number one, this goes without saying, and again, the world doesn't seem to understand this. It doesn't seem as exciting to them. Uh, but the number one reason that heaven's going to be so great is because God is there. The Lamb is there. You know, people are always like, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven. I'm going to go find my grandma who I've been missing for all these years. I'm like, well, that's probably not true. <laughs> You get to heaven, you're like, I want to see Jesus. <laughs> and uh, and I, maybe in your, in your corrupted body, you think, like, man, I want to go see this. I want to go see, see that. Maybe there's some people in the Bible you've been wanting. And Lord willing, we'll get to ask some people in the Bible some questions throughout eternity, right? <laughs> but, uh, but you're not going to want to see them. You're going to want to see the Lord. You're going to want to uh, see God face to face. And, uh, and so the, the most beautiful thing about heaven is that God's going to be there. Uh, chapter uh, 21, verse 3 says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Uh, look at verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, that's talking about Jesus, are the temple of it. Chapter 22, verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no more night, and they, uh, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. 
Now, we don't understand it because we're in corruptible bodies right now. But in our incorruptible bodies, in our glorified bodies, when we stand before God, you know what? I believe that's all we're going to need for all eternity is just God. You know, if we were one of the 24 elders who our job, or one of the cherub, cherubim, and our job was just through all eternity to just sit at the feet of, Je- uh, of Jesus and say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and, and just sing praises to Him. You say right now, well, that would get really boring. Yeah, I don't think it will in heaven. <laughs> your, your, your desires and your emotions and the things that you want could be completely different, and you're going to live in, in a, a perfect bliss even better than what you experienced housing your reign with the best conditions that you could have on earth. Things are going to get better. <clears throat> Next thing uh, that we see here in this text, the first thing, the only thing that really matters is that God's there. That's the best thing. But a second thing we see that helps us to understand how good it's going to be, look at verse 4, chapter 21, verse 4. There are no more things that bring discomfort. In the things in this life, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of things that bring discomfort and make this life a little bit harder to... Uh, uh, to tolerate, okay? Here's what we see uh, in, in uh, verse 4. We see, God shall wipe away all their tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now, for the thousand years in the millennial kingdom, as wonderful as everything's going to be, I believe that there's still pain. There's still sorrow, all right? I believe there will probably be sorrow at the great white throne judgment. Obviously, there will be sorrow for those people who are getting ready to go to the lake of fire, but I believe maybe there will be times where there will be some sort of sorrow because of the recognizing that we could have done more for the Lord or, or hey, certain loved ones uh, you know, might uh, be cast into the lake of fire. I don't know how we'll feel that or what we'll think about that, but I, it's, it's not that sorrow doesn't exist in the millennial kingdom. But when we get to... I mean, I mean, it's it's minimized. That's no doubt about that. But when we get into uh, eternity, there's no death. There's no sorrow. We see basically what it comes down to is there's no curse. It says after the fall of man, God cursed the earth and things just weren't like they were originally whenever he created them. Uh, And so we're not going to have those curses anymore. We're not going to have death and pain and sorrow and all that. Uh, We noticed uh, in chapter 22, verse 2, again, some would say this is metaphoric. I believe it's literal, but but I certainly can't explain it all completely. But we see that there's this river of life and this tree of life that exists there. Uh, In the midst of the street of it, this is uh, chapter 22, verse 2. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there a tree of life which bare 12 manners of fruit and yield her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. Let me see here. Uh, let's look at uh, uh, verse... Let me see here. Where does it talk about the... Uh... Yeah, so that was both of them. So we had the water of... Oh, verse 1 talked about the water of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of, uh, of, water of life clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So there's no more death there. There's just kind of like in the Garden of Eden, right? Before they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they had access to the tree of life, and they were able to live forever. And after the fall of man, God guarded that tree of life. Well, in heaven, in eternity, that tree of life exists, and it's there, and there's no more uh, curse, and there's no more death. Now, here's the thing. You can have... A situation theoretically let's say that you have no death you're never gonna die and this is how it is in the millennial kingdom but yet not necessarily no more pain no more suffering I don't know how it's gonna be for us exactly but you could be that I could exist where you have eternal life God gives you eternity but you still have suffering all right that could be a that, uh, that could exist but here it says that there's gonna be no more sorrow in verse 21 chapter 21 verse 4 there's gonna be no more pain there's going to be no more sin. Look at uh, verse 27, chapter 21, verse... Well, let's look at verse 8 first. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Look at chapter... Same chapter, verse 27. 
And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Look, this is really important because there are groups of people out here that will twist these words and make it sound like, hey, you're not going to heaven unless you don't do the things on this list and you're perfect and you don't have any of this. Well, look, we've all messed that one up, <laughs> right? All liars. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. In chapter 21, verse 8, it says, All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. And so some people say, well, yeah, well, I may have told a lie before, but I'm not a liar. And in chapter 21, verse uh, 27, it says, There shall not in, uh, in uh, no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie. <laughs> right? So one lie makes you a liar. And the point is that there's no sin in heaven. So he's not saying that you have to be perfect to get to heaven. Here's what he's saying. When your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're guaranteed entry into eternal life. And when you get into eternal life, you're not going to be any of those things. The sin doesn't exist anymore. Your inner man is what lives forever. This body's got to go. It's going to perish because it's sinful flesh. But your inner man, the, 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 that's that godly part that's born again, it's going to exist in heaven forever. All those other things are not going to be there to corrupt mankind and to, and to, uh, and to curse our world. So now here's the mystery, okay? This is a mystery. If you think about this, you say, boy, that sure would be nice to have a life of ease, no pain, no sorrow, no, none of this. You know, in our fallen state right now, the way we live and the way our bodies work, it's not possible. Here's why. Because if you don't have any pain, you don't even know what it feels like to not have pain. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't even know how to enjoy something because you don't know what to compare it to. If you don't work, you don't know how to appreciate things. This is how, in our current state right now, this, this, this law, this is a different law. In our current state right now, we have to have suffering to be able to enjoy. This is why a working man's uh, uh, sleep is so sweet. You work really hard and you appreciate that. And you go to bed and you're like, man, this feels so good. Well, if you didn't ever work, you wouldn't be able to appreciate that sleep. You see what I'm saying? Everything in this life that we enjoy, that we love, it's because we have something to compare it to that's that's less, all right? I don't know how it works, but in eternity, what do we got to compare it to? All we know is that God's there and everything's perfect and He makes sure that, uh, uh, that everything is, uh, is just as perfect as it can be. Our minds can't even fathom how it's going to work. The third thing that we see here, however, about what I just said, about not, uh, you know, not understanding uh, how to enjoy something unless we, we, we had some suffering in our life, whatever. So here's what some people would think about that is they would be like, well, man, I just can't wait until I don't have to serve anybody anymore. I'm tired of working for my boss. I'm tired of this and that. Look, you're never even in eternity going to get out of service. <laughs> okay. Because one thing that does exist in heaven is your service to the Lord, but you're going to love it. Okay. You're going to love serving the Lord. Uh, there is no greater master. Uh, even on this earth, there's no greater master. But in eternity, no greater master. Look at verse, uh, chapter 22, verse 3 again. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. I don't know how it works, but what if, you're, uh, what if your whole job, you know, I remember uh, as a kid making fun of the, and it is, it is silly, but, uh, you know, there's even a song in our song where it talks about a, a harp and crown. And I remember as a kid thinking about the cartoons that I'd seen and, and somebody, you know, they, uh, the cartoon, they die. And the next thing you know, they're like flying on this cloud and all they've got is a harp in their hand. And it's just kind of like, well, this really stinks. <laughs> it ain't going to be like that. Okay. You're actually going to, you're going to love your service to the Lord. And I don't know what he's going to have us do. I don't know how it's going to work, but trust me, you're going to love it. You can't even fathom how great it's going to be to serve the living God. Uh, let's uh, look at, uh, uh, let me see, chapter 21, verse 12. The fourth thing, why heaven's going to be so beautiful, is we are going to have friends, family, fellow, fellowship with, uh, we're all going to be one big family, okay, in heaven. Uh, chapter 21, verse 12 says, uh, and it had a great, it had a wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the name written thereon, 
uh, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, and on the south uh, three gates, on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in, in uh, them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay, so we have there at the, at the beginning, it's talking about the 12 tribes. Uh, and then when we get down to the foundation, it's talking about the 12 apostles. Like, I don't think in eternity, like their name is just going to be engraved, uh, you know, on the gate and on the foundation. I don't think that's the point there. Uh, I think they're, the, obviously they are really, they had eternal life as well. They're going to be there. Can you imagine you actually are going to be living in eternity, serving God with the original 12, <laughs> you know, uh, with the original apostles, minus Judas, he's not going to be there. <laughs> and, you, and we have uh, those people and all throughout eternity, all of our favorite Bible characters, all the great preachers that we've heard of over the years and great men of God and women of God will be there as well. Uh, man, if you have your family, and your family saved, they're going to be there as well. That's a great thing to uh, remind each other and to comfort one another with that. But none of that compares, obviously, to the fact that we'll be with the Lord, we'll be serving Him and uh, in this perfect state. But we will have uh, friends, fellow laborers. Look at verse uh, 24. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and their honor into it. Won't it be neat to finally meet Solomon in all his glory, <laughs> right? Not going to compare it to, to Christ in all his glory, but he's going to be there. Uh, all the kings are going to be there that have been that were saved, and all the uh, the nations and the people over eternity. Man, we're going to have, I believe, still have fellowship with believers. Isn't that one of the greatest things? Again, people outside of the church, you know, don't understand that. And I've heard people say, well, I just don't, I just can't be around people. This is why I don't go to church. I just get anxious and I can't be around people. I'm like, that's unfortunate. Like, I can understand what that feels like. I don't necessarily like being around people either if I go to Walmart or I go to <laughs> But when I'm around God's people, I enjoy it. Thursday nights, man, uh, we get to stay here. I don't have to rush back to Iola. We get to stay here. Sometimes we're here till like midnight. And I still had an hour and a half drive back, back home, but I, we don't want to leave because we enjoy the fellowship. I'm not saying everybody can hang around that time. I understand that. But I'm just saying, isn't it sweet to fellowship with like-minded believers? And can you imagine doing it together and serving the Lord together uh, for all eternity? I don't know how it's going to be, but it's going to be wonderful, even better than the millennium, which is going to be uh, wonderful enough in itself. Finally, uh, we see this is you know, more superficial, maybe not super important, but I'm glad uh, that it'll be there. And that is beauty, just the actual beauty. I was talking about how beautiful heaven will be, but I'm talking about physical beauty like we think of it. Uh, we read about all the beautiful stones and the mountain and the river coming uh, down and the, and the tree of life with the 12 fruits and all that stuff. I personally love that stuff. I love nature. I like artwork. I like... Uh, uh, beautiful uh, jewels and stuff like that to look at and to, and to be beautiful. It'd be kind of boring without that stuff. Now, obviously, whatever God gives it to us, we're going to enjoy it. But, uh, uh, but I'm glad that the Bible talks about all these beautiful things that we get to look at and these fruit, this fruit that we get to eat. Now, I'm, I'm, I don't know how it's going to work. I'm kind of hoping that we're not going to have to be vegetarians, but <laughs> maybe we'll be feasting on a, a, a spiritual manna and spiritual meat. <laughs> You know that, uh, but uh, but but uh, however this works, I'll, again, we are all fallible. Our minds can only go so far. There's so much that I don't understand about God's word and and about eternity. But man, just reading on the little bit that He gave us in these two chapters, and then just thinking about the fact that man, this is a great way to end the book of Revelation. After all the death and the destruction, after going through persecution and the, and the killing of the saints and all that kind of stuff, and then you got just God just wiping out all the sinful flesh on this earth, and then it's like, how do we conclude this? Well, we conclude it by God's people dwelling in all eternity, worshiping God, serving God, fellowshipping with one another, enjoying all the blessings that He has for us for all eternity. Amen. What a way to end this series. What a way to end the Bible. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is the conclusion of the Bible. Now, this is what I love about the Bible. It gives us the creation. The first day of creation is how the Bible starts. 
And how does the Bible end? It gives us into eternity. <laughs> you say, well, I think we should squeeze in some other books of the Bible. It can't happen. We've already got the Bible in its completion. The final revelation of God from the very beginning to stuff that we haven't even seen yet, but it's already written. It's already recorded. We can't add to or take away from it. That's what he says in, uh, in Revelation. But I sure can enjoy it, and I can fantasize and think about how wonderful it's going to be, but I know that I'll never come close to really, really experiencing it. And aren't you thankful to the Lord that for your salvation and the fact that you'll be there? Meanwhile, uh, you know, billions of people suffering for eternity in hell. I'm so glad we won't have to uh, have any part of the second death. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for the, just the, the confidence that we can have and the knowledge uh, that we're saved and, and on our way to heaven. And though we might fall short in our understanding of what eternity will be like and, uh, and maybe even uh, just think about the things uh, that we see recorded that we're going to do, and I, particularly ch children, I know sometimes will think that that's not exciting and it's boring and that they're going to miss out on the things in this life if they went to heaven. But Lord, help us understand that uh, that you are uh, you are way beyond anything we can think and fathom, and that you will uh, you will reward exceedingly. Uh, for the things that uh, we've, anything that we've given up in this life, you'll, you'll reward. And, uh, and I pray that you'll help us to grow in our time that we have in this life uh, as, as mortal men. Help us learn to grow in our service towards you and our love for you and our service to you and our, and our, and our fellow believers and loved ones. Uh, Lord, as we just begin to have just a little bit of taste and experience how wonderful that is, uh, in comparison to how eternity is going to be, Lord, when you give us the ability to do these things in our glorified bodies without the curse, without sin, without all these things, uh, we glorify you, Lord, and praise you and uh, look forward to eternity in heaven with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.